Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Art Puzzle Miami Beach Conversations. This is our biennial talk, and it is how is private funding affecting biennials? Um, of course, a complicated question. We'll get many different perspectives. I'm very happy to introduce our moderator today, Mark Rappolt. You're in very good hands with Mark. He's been doing this a long time. Um, Mark Rappolt is editor in chief at. Um, Oh my God, really, Mary? Um, Art Review and Art Review Asia, and, and based in London and Shanghai. Mark, <laughs> thank you very much. And let's give them a warm round of applause for welcoming them. Um, hi, thanks all for coming at the beginning of um, Cocktail Hour in Miami. Um, I'd introduce the speakers very briefly. Um, Beside me is Michelle Grabner, who's an artist and the artistic director of the Front International in Cleveland, which took place this year. And next to her is Diana Nawe, who is an independent curator based in Los Angeles and co-artistic director for Prospect 5 New Orleans. And at the end is Nicolas Burio, who's curating next year's Istanbul Biennial and is the director of Montpellier Contemporain. So, I guess to begin this talk, one of the things we probably have to acknowledge is that, the, um, that art and private funding are long-term bedfellows. So what we're talking about in some ways is not new. Um, most of the institutions we refer to as public were set up by industrialists, uh, businessmen, bankers, and before that, um, by kings and popes and cardinals. And I think we could argue that those are probably not exactly public in any modern sense of the world. Um, I think what's maybe changed recently is that artists and art have uh, looked more at the structures uh, through which art gets displayed and produced, and the structures of power, the structures of the economies, and all these things. You can look to Hans Hacker, maybe Andrea Fraser's project from a couple of years ago, um, Museums, Money, and Politics, Nan Golding's campaign about the Sackler funding of the arts, um, and many more besides, and then more activist groups like Gulf Labor and things like that. So um, I think it's become a much more pressing issue, and I guess with biennials, the sort of sums involved are perhaps larger, and the structures are both permanent and temporary, which is a kind of particular situation that differs from the, those other ones in, in art. Um, and then as a kind of reassurance, um, this is not a talk about accountancy, much more about accountability. Um, but having said that, I thought it would be interesting for each of the speakers to introduce themselves and the biennials or triennials they're working on um, by saying to what extent public funding forms a part of that. Do you want to go first, Michelle? Sure, sure. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, I, you're right. The horse is out of the barn. Uh, there's no putting it back in. Uh, and I also I think it's common knowledge, particularly in the state, that it's public funding isn't going to increase. All right? that we, we, we can, right now, corporate funding is actually increasing in projects like this, and I'm talking about the US. Um, so a little bit about Front International, which concluded at the end of this, uh, September. It's the first triennial in Cleveland. And it's a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's so entangled. It, Front, as an exhibition, um, one of its strengths is its great partnership with other institutions. So we're looking at the Cleveland Museum of Art, we're looking at MOCA, we're looking at the Cleveland Clinic, which is an important hospital. We're looking at educational structures such as the CIA or Oberlin. And all of those institutions have their own entanglement with public and private um, uh, resources. The projects that we were engaging in in the Federal Reserve or the public library, um, what they could bring to the table was very slight. So there was a lot of also public support that would have to come in with those offsite projects. So it's a very hard question to answer. I, I would say that my understanding of it in working with Fred Bidwell, who's the executive director, um, it's very hard to give you an exact number, but it's well over 50% that's coming from private sources. And Diane? Um, so Prospect actually is majority funded privately, 98% actually, um, with the exception of what? Michelle indicates which are the reliance on existing infrastructure that is publicly funding. For instance, in New Orleans, we will be the fifth edition of Prospect and have consistent partnerships with both universities, private and public, as well as museums that have take public money. But Prospect is almost entirely private and has been. As I feel I will be very bad in trying to generalize 
about those topics, you know, I will really try as much as I do, you know, to explain that it's not possible to generalize by talking about very specific situations I've been exp I experienced in the past. But to take you know, the, the, my current situation, for example, uh, the institution I'm working on at the moment <clears throat> is a public funded uh, institution in Montpellier, 100%. It's the city, actually, and the metropole around, which is a very luxurious you know, uh, situation. Yeah. And Istanbul, biennial, is exactly the opposite. But here, and that's maybe the only thing I can, you know, uh, say that could, you know, why not be interesting there is this debate, you know, is the fact that it all depends on context, you know, the relationship between the private and the public, private money, public money, depends on a game of, you know, power which is specific to each context. So yeah, it's very difficult to generalize. But maybe um, to follow on with that, I guess implicit in the question we're discussing is the idea that public money somehow comes with no strings attached and is this great utopian thing where you do what you like, whereas private money, you're always in debt to something, you're always instrumentalized as curators. I mean, I wonder to what extent that's true because I think in a lot of cases, public money can come with much more I baggage. Think that, yeah, I'm gonna jump in with this. My experience with Front is that the, our public support came with a greater criteria of outcome. We were, public money is outcome driven, right? So um, whether it's with, in my case, uh, the city of Cleveland, whether it's regional money, the Cuyahoga Regional Arts Center, or whether it's um, the state house coming out of um, um, Columbus, Ohio, I was finding that the criteria attached to money coming from the public sector is more outcome driven these days than private money. And it was a surprise to me. Your experience? I mean, institutionally, I find that in the entanglements with the county or these kind of idea that you serve taxpayers and the public is quite different than private funding, which might speak to a more general kind of conception of what art can do or should do. But as you say, you're not quite as obligated in the same kind of um, quantitative way, I think. Again, I can talk about very contrasted experiences, actually. Uh, for example, at when we started the Palais de Tokyo in Paris at the beginning of the 2000s, in 2002, it was supposedly public money, actually, but if you, if we, you took the budget, it was just enough to pay the people and the electricity, and that was it. <laughs> so we had to find every cent you know, to make exhibitions. So it's a complicated situation, contrasted one, but here the, the the game was to try to constitute a completely mixed economy between the two. So it can happen also. And in a way, public money can correct private money and vice versa. You know? And that, that's really what I believe. You know? Because it, it's all depending on the, the... Public money has not the same meaning in Cuba or Miami, for example. But I guess that also raises the question in terms of when you conceive of the concepts for a biennial, triennial, large-scale art event, to what extent you work with an existing budget and to what extent, if you want to do a certain thing, it's your job to go and find that extra money for it. Um, you hear a lot about curators complaining that before they used to just spend the money, now they have to make the money in order to spend the money. Um, to what extent is fundraising an integral part of being an artistic director of one of these events? It has never been for me. Um, and I don't think I would sign up for a project in which I would have to take on that role. Uh, Fred Bidwell, the executive director of Front, uh, took on that role. Um, you know, I, but then yeah. do you give him a list of, these are the projects, this is what I need? Or um, does he mm -hmm. tell you, no, this no, is no. what you can spend? No, no, for the, for the most part. I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty arbitrary about this co-blending that we're talking about between public and private. I, it's a reality. I have to approach it as a reality. So whether it's the Portland Biennial, with, which is a regional, all public funded exhibition, um, Front, like I was saying, in Cleveland, a blended exhibition between public and private resources, and then the Whitney Biennial, uh, which is all a given, right? Um, taking that as arbitrary, and my role as curator then is working within that structure and looking for places within the funding and support structure, and of course, most importantly, the conceit of the exhibition, to find places where it is not transactional. 
point, um, where I can find possibilities of transformation that don't come with those strings attached, as you were talking about. So that is the work that I'm doing. It's not about going out and bringing in resources. It's finding within a, a given project how that money is distributed, where it is coming from, and being able to diligently look and create spaces in which that transaction doesn't happen. <coughs> I, uh, conversely, I think part of uh, myself and my co-artistic director's responsibility is fundraising. It's not um, the priority for us, but certainly I think as you indicate, there's a given budget. And if you want to be more ambitious than that, then I think that would become really a conversation with the executive director and the board about where those funds will come from. But I like Michelle, I mean, I like the idea that you can rely on other resources or create other economies in some way around projects. And I think that Front is very much similar to Prospect in that it is a citywide biennial and in that way embeds itself in pre-existing economies or kinds of um, networks that have a different set of numbers attached to them or have, you know, and that you're sort of making use of what's there in a non-economic sense, I think. Right, I totally agree and uh, maybe we should say that uh some strings are really good to have, actually. <laughs> if you use public money, you know, or even private money in the case of Istanbul Biennial, there is an educational you know, role of the Biennial in Istanbul, for example, the whole year long. Actually, it doesn't stop with the moment of the Biennial. It's a foundation, it's an NGO, and it has a program, and actually it's part of the, the scene in uh, Istanbul. So it's... And in a way, it's part of the deal which has been made also with the different uh, funders of the of the biennial education, you know, and also you know lots of programs which are actually linked uh, to to the to the biennial. Those are links. Those are strings, also, but good strings, I think. No, but you could call that structure, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder, you talked about like puppets, a bit. you know, puppets need strings. Exactly. <laughs> You're never really free. <laughs> um, <It's a> <laughs> um, I wonder, you, you mentioned kind of trying to please the transactional nature of some of the funding, and I wonder to what extent it's increasingly becoming the role of a curator to exercise a kind of moral judgment about where the money comes from, how the money is derived, and how... I guess how the finance of what we think of as being this kind of bubble of creativity and aesthetics interacts with the world and the society around it. Is that something that's changed or? I don't, yeah, that is, um, you know, my stomach lurches when you ask that question. Um, we are in a, a, you know, we're in a call out culture, right? And we're seeing that happen when we're looking at um, where funding comes from with uh, people on the board and trustees, right? We're seeing that happen right now. Um, so I, I anticipate that happening. I'm not quite sure, Mark, to be perfectly honest, where that responsibility um, lies. Do you have any idea? Any thoughts? I think it's a matter of transparency and conversation, like with your organization. But ultimately, I think the curator, in some ways, operates in is part forming that organization's identity, but also in deference to that organization, ultimately. I mean, you know, it depends. And I think there are moments when you, you could rally against funding or have that conversation in a really meaningful way and talk about what the consequences would be, I think, for artists, for the organization, for the reputation, for the politics. But I think there's some question about the larger ethical structure of the institution, whatever that may be, I think. Can, can I ask you, would you bring that up to the artist? If an artist is doing a project as Michael Rackowitz did at Spaces yeah. and that money is coming from somewhere, would you sit down and have that conversation with the artist? I, I previously, yes, have mentioned whatever the funding. I mean, I worked at the Perez Art Museum for a long time. We have a lot of partnerships for small commissions around clo clothing companies. Mm -hmm. And so in a much less ethical sense, but in an almost aesthetic sense, mm -hmm. you know, I would say, I just, are you okay to be tied to this company or what does it mean to have a shoe company or men's jackets tied to your exhibition in some way. And I think, you know, I'm, I think artists are, like curators, quite realistic about where money comes from. And so some things that I thought, oh, they'll, they'll balk at this, I think that, that wasn't the case. But I think that, for me, it was always a matter of transparency. And, and it can be an issue if you're taking government funding from an international government that another artist is not you know, um, on board with, or those kinds of things have come up, and I have had to play those out in the institution, and 
I mean, I haven't had an incident where we've handed money back, but it's definitely been the subject of deep um, soul searching, but also like some kinds of logistical and infrastructural shifts had to happen to kind of accommodate different artists' politics or ethics around finances. Shared responsibility anyway. And transparency is here because, uh, for example, you can find the sponsors and uh, where the money comes from at the end of the catalog every, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's all here. No. Yeah. So you know it from the beginning. No. But it's, of course, I don't like this term of policy, but no. <clears throat> because I tend to think that artists, um, for example, don't have to um, initiate or instigate norms. No. And policy is referring to norms for me. You know, so maybe I would use a different term, um, <clears throat> which is about the most important issue being, you know, uh, of course, transparency. But I don't see any binial which would be, uh, you know, we shouldn't, which is not clear about it for the moment, as far as I know. But maybe I, I don't know every one of them. But you know. But I guess maybe what this is driving towards is increasingly we have this sense that there is good money and bad money. And who is it who decides that? And I think, again, it comes down to context. Yeah, completely. Um, no. For example, just a tiny example, one of the sponsors of the Istanbul Biennial is a technology company. And this big, the biggest one in Turkey, a technology company, has a branch which works with the military, for example. Mm. This is the kind of questions actually yeah. which are, have been you know, raised all the time. What do you do then? No, it's complicated because uh, it's a part of an activity of a company, but it's also you know, at the core uh, of, this, uh, of the debate. Should we tend to think in this specific case because it's not, there are companies I wouldn't work with, no, frankly. Um, because it's so blatantly, you know, uh, outrageous that <laughs> it's diff it would be difficult to, to not to corrupt the the project you are working on, and then you have a gray zone. That's this gray zone that we. Yeah, I mean, I think that binary proposition is just untenable, right? And I also think we have to ask the question about the ameliorative capabilities of art. I mean, I think a lot of what our institutions the role we play is a kind of social balm that kind of helps clean money and, and create social, ethical, political capital in the public sphere. And so I think that is also something that, that is a little bit what we're trading in yeah. return for capital. And I think it, if to think about it in this kind of binary terms is sort of also, I mean, it's the Hakka example. You trace any money far enough back, it gets it's all bad. quite complicated. And it was interesting, I mean, what was it? In, Australia, the Sydney, you know, the, that was kind of an interesting thing where the artists protested and had, I mean, I think the board member who was responsible yeah. for some of these um, immigrant incarceration centers stepped off eventually. So, so that was a kind of interesting example of seeing the artists really take a stand against it, but I think it put the curators in a very complicated role. Well, I think it was the structure as a whole because that was their biggest funder. Yeah. And then they had to find it from somewhere else. Um, and I guess what happened there would put off other funders from giving any money if they're going to be scrutinized in, in these kinds of ways. Um, I mean, but you mentioned the sort of idea that, I guess, now with art washing and that somehow art shows legitimize um, certain activities, certain types of money, certain things. Is that really the case? Is it not just something that happens in society at large? It does. No, I think it, it would be very restrictive and unfair to keep, to keep it only for uh, art activities, anyway. Yeah. Well, it also would be kind of pointless if you were no. just doing it within that We sphere. have to cope with the fact that it's much more, you know, global than that. Mm. And um, is that something that, where the response be is to the local context of the biennial or triennial, or is it a global thing? Because I think that's the interesting thing, that these events are now projected as being part of a global mapping exercise, but at the same time they happen in very particular places with very particular sets of rules. Um, Again, it's a, for me it's completely contextual. You know, I, I curated the um, Athens Biennial in 2011. It was really the worst moment ever. You know, 
curate this biennial. I'm super lucky. No. And uh, the, there was an estimated budget. And at the end, um, I think, you know, it does almost nothing, actually. So I was not paid, nobody was paid. It was, we, we ended up doing a biennial with no money at all. You know, borrowing things, you know, uh, going to... It was an experience. I was, you know, good to um, come back to my beginnings. <laughs> but it was very funny and uh, very lively, you know. So at this, at this moment, we could have even taken money from gangsters. No. <laughs> or by any means necessary. And I also think to the local context, money comes from different places and different social issues that money is tied to are more pressing in certain contexts, whether it's gentrification and your board is developers, whether it's, you know, opioids in New York. or You know, so I think some of that is a sort of um, the particularity of what the social issues that may or may not be relevant. And, and the way in which people are comfortable with money circulating, which you know, I think is also quite locally specific. Yeah, yeah I keep thinking uh, on, a, on a local front and thinking about um, what actually those numbers are. Um, the, ad, the, the average NEA grant is about $25,000 in the US. And an average local grant, we're looking at about $5,000 if we're lucky. So then you start thinking about the administrative costs yeah. Uh, embedded in um, um, getting that little bit of money as well. I, I, I would like to um, go back to the strings that you keep talking about because I think that is more problematic for me than thinking of good money and bad money right now. As we become outcome-driven, um, we're an outcome-driven transactional culture. Um, the performance of metrics and how that actually changes um, not only art making, but participation as well. That, for me, is um, more difficult, I think, than pulling apart um, money sources. I mean, do you think that comes partly about because, um, to some degree, biennials have become branding exercises, where they've already, in a sort of transactional deal, inevitably with the place they're in, to bring in more tourists, more money. Certainly with the prospect, for instance, that's very much part of what the original promise was was to have a financial outcome or a visibility outcome for the particular place it exists in. And if you already commit to that, aren't you opening the door to everything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that mass mocha model. It's like art as economic kind of rejuvenation model. And I think art can make many promises. That is, I mean, that is part of it. There's a huge, I mean, Miami is a living testament to the arts economy as generating culture and civic energy and all of these things, but I think Prospect, for instance, it is a branding exercise absolutely for the city, but you know, visual arts play a very small role in a city that is otherwise incredibly touristic, just like Miami. I mean, these are cities where their entire economies are contingent on people visiting. And so these festival or fair kind of moments I think are very critical, but I think in the art world, Prospect seems like a major force in New Orleans, but historically, Prospect hasn't even kept economic data. So there aren't reportable numbers in that way. It's a sensation at this point that of economic um, growth and an influx of tourists. But I think that it's part of a kind of idea around this. But I think the actual metrics are quite question, you know, how do you measure that? I mean, there is like bodies and hotel beds, I think is are things that we do. I'm sure with Cleveland, they were very carefully keeping track of that. But I think some of those Again, what, what are we trading? Like this kind of question of like, how, what can we actually put a number next to it and a sign, I think is quite nebulous still. I guess there's this feeling maybe that I'm like, I don't know, like a hotel owner in Venice and because of the biennial, I know for that opening week, I can double my prices and kind of make up for all my losses the rest of the year. And it, you know, it goes down to like small businesses as well as sort of big corporations. Um, there is a matter of city branding, of course, but also uh, geographical and historical issues, geostrategical even. For example, there's a biennial in San Paolo because at the time in the 60s, it was more Rio, whose museum was more developed at the time. Venice was not the city of uh, art, you know, uh, modern art, you know, in the, at the end of the 19th century. Um, Istanbul lacked infrastructures, etc., etc. So I think biennials arrive to complement 
uh, to complete the situation, to reinforce, enhance such a such aspect of the um, of this city. So, yeah, and then of course, very easily, very quickly, it becomes uh, city branding and uh, part of the. But I guess um, to this good money, bad money, like subtextually there's some implication that all money is bad, like that this capitalist endeavor of filling beds in a hotel is bad, but I mean, we're at an art fair. I mean, we, you know, we're, we are part of a larger capitalist system and it's not, we need to generate economy. And actually, you know, I find, you know, museums make all of these promises around social good, that it's for the children and it's education and it's this. That is un, you cannot quantify that. And so you're making promises that are sort of, you know, uh, lavender mist Artistic. kind of. Yeah and, the, yeah, and I think this idea that maybe it's better to say this many people came to your city. And I found living in Miami, because of the understanding of art's economic engine, it was easier to get city money because they understand that there's a whole economy around this and that it is, I mean, job creation and all of these things. And I think that, I think, Organizations and nonprofits need to think about leveraging what they actually do economically contribute. It's nine jobs, it's ten jobs, it's a hundred jobs. And I think that is important. And I think this kind of idea that we could separate ourselves out from that, as if art is not totally tied to economy, I think is, is hard. But I think we're still in that space where we like to pretend that somehow it's not, that we're clean or there's some purity to what we do. But, which again relies on this kind of binary idea that money is bad. I, I like what you're saying about um, Prospect New Orleans. So front being the first front, we really had to talk people in. We had to do uh, anticipate economic generators. We didn't have those, right? And sitting in front of art boards, really articulating that if you are going to give us money to our artists in residency program, we can't guarantee what the outcome will be. And that was maddening to me. Um, but when you're talking about uh, Prospect New Orleans, um, it is now known, right? It is a known commodity. So even if you don't have those metrics, it does have a brand to it. Yeah. So I think coming out the block with Cleveland, that was yeah. very difficult, trying to get people on board, trying to trust that it's actually going to help the little shops on the street and that we're going to bring in those many people um, into the city. Were those the promises? Did you find yourself arguing more for the on the ground metrics, i.e. this is an economic generator, or was it more kind of social promise and energy and culture. Yeah, for me it was frustrating because it was really talking about some of the essentials of thinking about what art is and that there may not be an outcome. We may bring in artists from Madrid and we, you know, three years, this is a triennial, we may not know what's going to happen in three years and that is a good thing. That is part of what an artist is, what artists can be. And that is very difficult for the people who hold the purse strings to understand. That is the transaction that I'm talking about. But then what would be the, um, did you have in mind other measurements of the success? Uh, talking about the work itself, talking about those ideas. This is where you know one has to become the educator, um, and, and just talking about possibilities. And then how? Uh, and this is this is the problem with transaction. Transaction has to happen in real time. And talk about the abstraction of time. That having an artist come in from Madrid, you know, may have an impact, but it may have an impact in 20 years from now in a different way and try to speak to all of those possibilities and that those possibilities are um, of benefit and we should invest in them. It's true that uh, I totally agree. Biennials are activators of uh, sociality, of uh, you know, discussions, etc. But not all cities need a biennial in a way because some actually have a network of either institutions or galleries you know, which provide this kind of uh, vibes. So it's interesting to see uh, biennials as pop-up art centers in a way. And they can be pop-up museums also, also sometimes, you know, by the way. But also I guess within that as well, biennials don't have to go on perpetually, I presume. Like the reasons for having one may have changed over time. But Venice point, Biennial yeah. and Istanbul Biennials, it's a perpetual movement. No, for example, these two ones at least. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I mean, this Cleveland is a new, mm -hmm. you know, in some way, Prospect is in some ways this like model for yeah. this off-center yeah. American biennial. At this, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about how, when you started that conversation, kind of the impetus for that biennial? Yeah, um, I'm going to actually jump, Diana, jump actually to the other side of it because it's over now. And it, what's interesting and frustrating to me because I'm in the kind of self-reflexive critical uh, looking back. And with 
so the success, and this is not my success, but the success from our executive director and going forward to 2021, the success is those numbers that have been generated, right? So he is going forward with a set of numbers. Um, and the success is leaving 2018 behind and bringing in a new curator for 2021. So all of the kind of critical underpinning of how the work lives, how artists engage, uh, engage in the community, that we're not talking about, and that frustrates me. I think that should be part of a kind of debriefing and looking at it, but that is not how triennials uh, live and die. It's, it's a harvesting of those numbers, and it is moving on to the next one often, um, and that's frustrating to me. Do you think in a way you've made the job of the next artistic director more difficult because you've left them with these metrics? Uh, oh, that's interesting. I was thinking that it would be easier for them. <laughs> I guess now they have a kind of standard to at least meet. Yeah. <laughs> but some anyway. of that I think isn't the job of, I mean, that is sort of what's interesting about having curators on a panel about funding. In an ideal universe, that's not our purview. We, we are aware of it, we touch it, we assist with it, but ultimately that's always this ED versus artistic director model. And so in some ways you think of the organization as being responsible for the metrics and we as, as we do are the content providers within some infrastructure that exists outside. I mean both institutionally and biennially, this is sort of the model that we're used to, but I think that is shifting and I almost think even generationally, you know, from me to you, I think there's a kind of, like my generation is more like, of course we song and dance and do the fundraising for our exhibit. You know, and I think there's a whole generation of curators that are like, not me, man. And I think that has been really interesting to kind of see that shift, the kind of flexibility that yeah. my generation is, you know, we just came up. That was always part of it. I mean, do you think also there's a sort of different sense of what the scale and size of biennials should be now that they've become these sort of more bloated things than they used to be. I mean, you talked about your no budget against the money welcome biennial. Um, was that a kind of liberating thing to do or was it just completely oppressive? I think, every, you know, I'm, maybe I'm very naive, you know, or, or very uh, stupid, but I like uh, diverse experiences. You know, every biennial should be an adventure in a way because it is an adventure. Completely, it's like uh, I would you just arrive in a city that you might not know very well. You meet a lot of people, you know, you're like a detective in a film, you know, like, like I'm trying to solve a mystery, a riddle, or an enigma, you know. And you have to come with a project, you know. Every time, it's different. And the scale, you know, can be... The, the Athens Biennial, for example, uh, curated the Kaunas Biennial in Lithuania, for example. It was a great experience. Not exactly the same uh, or importance than Lyon Biennial or, or Istanbul, or etc. Both are interesting. You, know, it's, uh, you have to rescale your own brain and, and adapt your project to the, the situation again. I had a, um, summer, my summer of biennials, and I went to like five biennials, and it was just kind of really you know, as a kind of comparative exercise to kind of start back and say, okay, what is a biennial? How do these things function? And they're all so uniquely tied to their own context in terms of the citywide, the institutional, et cetera. And these kind of, this idea that we're all, I mean, we are a part of the same ecosystem, but when I sat down at the Carnegie and they handed out the guidebook, which was a beautiful hardbound book with gold embossing, and I thought, oh, this is not us. <laughs> like that kind of moment when you realize the economies surrounding the biennials are so different, but Again, it's such a, those parameters, those economic parameters, those geographic parameters, those questions are, are so formative in how you need to think about the project and how you need to think about engaging the city and what artists you call on and whether you have money or locked gallery doors or climate control or all, all of those things are so um, generative, I think, in this way and so diverse in this landscape of biennials. Yeah, and I, I'm going to weigh in because I think I come at it from just a slightly different position, and that is even the bloated biennial will have a con will, could offer a context to an artist that is new. And so it's always my, my measure of success is what can the various scales, the relationship to, uh, we're talking about funding, um, how that can offer the right artist a chance to stretch their own relationship to their work. So um, I will say yes to almost any configuration because that allows me then to be responsible to artists. Yeah. I think this, this kind of discourse is very important to me because it also 
shows that we agree on one thing. We don't know what a biennial is. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And people tend to know what it is now. You know, I've, I've seen many colleagues, actually, who absolutely know what a biennial is. Uh -huh. OK, good. No, it's, it's rhetoric, you see what I mean? Right. It's, uh, no, OK, biennial is this and that and that. It has to activate the local. T it has, it's stuck in a kind of, uh, you know, calcified definition, which I really which hate. Which is not true. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. You have to reinvent it every time. Uh -huh. I mean, leading from that and moving away a bit from money, um, to what extent um, do you have to like the place in which the biennial is taking place? <laughs> you have to like it. To what to extent do like you have to like it? Have to have it. Special <laughs> <in> my ear. <laughs> you were in Cleveland. <laughs> I was in Cleveland for a long time. Hate this place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think. Um, I, I, you know, that's. It's not. It's not that simple. I, when I started working on Cleveland now over three years ago, I thought I knew it because I had a relationship to the yeah. city prior. I had been doing some teaching there. I had a survey exhibition of my own work. And the more you're there, the more you understand that you don't. I mean, this is the paradox, right? You walk away after the exhibition is over and you still feel like you haven't even begun to scratch the surface of you know, what that city can offer. And it changed, right? Over three years or a two-year period, it changes before your eyes. So um, you can't, it's, you know, it's, uh, I think you need to pretend that you can grab it and frame it initially, and then as you start to evolve your ideas and start working with individuals um, and collaboration, it starts. you can allow it to be more naturally what it is, and that's changing and shifting. I also think you have to be willing to meet the city on its terms. Like, you have to be willing to do that work, I think. And seeing all these biennials, I mean, you kind of, I think a good biennial is site-specific, not in its, the nature of its projects, but in the nature of its engagement. And that you feel you just sat on the plane for four hours, three hours, 15 hours, that you went somewhere, and that you saw something that told you something about that place, even if that is a fiction about it, but that there's something quite responsive. And I think just in this globalized art world, it's like that, you, I wanna go somewhere. And I feel like that is quite, that is somewhat our responsibility. Whether we like this city or not, I think, is another question, but to be willing to, to meet it in a kind of deep way, I think is really the ethical and critical position that we have to take for these kind of, especially off-center biennials. I don't remember having hated a city where I created a biennial, but it, why not, actually? Um, can happen. Uh, maybe I'm gonna think twice and <laughs> give you another answer. You might learn to hate five it. Minutes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you're a, movie director, for example, if you go decide to shoot your movie in a specific place, it's not because you like it, no, but it, it does correspond to what you want to say, what the story you want to implement there. In a way, you were, of course, imposed the city at first, you know, but, you know, the, I think the functioning of the brain is a bit the same, you know, every, lots of things are decided that the first day you arrive in a place, if you had never been to this place before. Or we can collect a few memories. But for example, Istanbul, I've been there, I've seen all Istanbul biennials since 99. So I have a knowledge of it, I have memories, I have uh, places, I've been with some people, I, I can invent a story, you know, very easily. Some other places, you know, it's uh, just impossible. You know. But it just produces two different types of exhibitions. But that story has to be for Istanbul, or does that not matter? It has to, in a way, yeah. You know, it's maybe not for, you know, but it's based on, uh, corresponding to, uh, fitting into a situation, responding to a situation. So it makes a lot of uh, things. It's a mix of all those verbs, I would say. And it's also, I mean, the ethical responsibility of not instrumentalizing a city. Like, what are you giving back? Like, it's an exchange. I mean, it's not transactional, but there has to be a reciprocity. And so, I, I mean, I think everyone meets that out on different terms, but it is in some ways for, it must be for that city because who else is it for, right? I mean, I think there's a certain responsibility to think about that. How it manifests, I think, can be quite diverse, but I think... I mean, is that a responsibility to the audiences, to the citizens of the city, rather than we've talked previously about responsibilities to the artists and the artwork? Mm -hmm. Is this where the responsibility to the audience kicks in? 
Friend International, the theme that I gave it was an American city. So there was this kind of abstraction, um, but it was also a triennial that engaged not only Cleveland, but Oberlin and Akron. So it's a region, right? So regionality was equally important, starting to think about regions, starting thinking about the Great Lakes, right? So we start with city, then we start thinking about cities, and we start thinking about Ohio, but then um, doing studio visits. Part of the focus of the exhibition was this Great Lakes research where I was moving from Toronto to Buffalo to um, you know Milwaukee and Chicago and so forth. So. Uh, but then, but then also kind of pulling back even farther. And you, it's interesting, and I would like to hear what you have to say about um, the highly localized audience. They're the slowest audience. And this, I think, is a shame for thinking about the time frame of a biennial that, you know, the front came down and the, the local audience was still just coming to a kind of ownership of it, um, where, the regional audience or the international audience was starting to give a frame to it. That frame may not be truthful, but it's so interesting how it would to think about the continuation between what happens, you know, the next three years for the next, you know, the kind of play with that local audience. Thoughts? I mean, that's also a, um, an inherent problem of biennials. They pop up, they go away. They pop up, they go away. So it's quite the opposite than a, a museum, for instance, where there's a space and the, you know, this kind of slow relationship that one develops with somebody local, that you can do that. It's about this long-term, like, time-based relationship. And I think the biennial, I think that is a very, and I think that's something that Prospect has thought a lot about. Like, how do you, if you go dark for two years and then, you know, effectively, you have to knock on everyone's door all over again and say, remember us? We're, we did that thing that one time. Did you like it? You know, I think, so some of that kind of constantly having to reintroduce yourself is a complicated way. And I mean, I think with, inherent to biennials is some process that happens on the ground there that tends to bring people in in some ways, but I think it's it's a really complicated. I mean, I, I always look to Sharjah, who does March Meeting, and so they're always an annual point on the map. I mean, not to say that that is, March Meeting is particularly for the local audience, but it is a way of kind of keeping a certain energy and a certain year-round inertia around the organization, and I am always quite interested in their model for that biennial and institutional. Yeah, and my guess too, with funding, those strings again, um, that need to have long-term social impact, that is going to change the way we see exhibitions roll out and see that kind of continuous structure be pulled from one to the other um, based on funding. As curators, we're constantly uh, confronted to this memory, in a way, of the, because when you work on a biennial, you meet a lot of people, a lot of people who are local, France, uh, of France, etc., etc. It creates a kind of a small community and all of them will tell you about their memories of this place, this place, this place. So it's good sometimes to, to, to renew completely the, the <laughs> and change venues mm -hmm. completely so you're not comparable because as a, some places can be haunted you know, in a very particular way. I mean, maybe then, given that we're talking about audiences, Venice, we should um, open, yeah. We should open the conversation up to the audience directly in front of us. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you put your hands up and then wait for a microphone to arrive. So money is something, but um, how it affects the biennial is also another point, I think. Do you feel like the money that arrives to the biennial is affecting your decisions or in any way the direction of it, the, the critique of the, um, I think that's where it, becomes really important. Um, that, that's the main question. Uh, I can only answer for myself. It does not change one thing in the, well, except, of course, if you don't have money, it changes a lot of things. You know? But where the money comes from, or the way it's, then it's the way it's distributed, how much goes to the production, that's the most important, I think, but that's this amount, which is the, the capital one how much goes to the exhibition itself and how much goes to anything else. That's the, that's the only thing which is important. But money, uh, in an abstract in a way, doesn't affect the, the content of, uh, of uh, such an exhibition. And also the selection of the artists. I mean, you know, the galleries are involved with this as well. I think that they take care of the production costs, uh, logistics. So. I think I, it, 
I would be remiss to say that we don't ask what is fundable. I mean, that, that has to be a question for all cultural producers. What, I mean, whether that means, okay, we're applying for a Ford Foundation grant, the most important thing to them this year is audience inclusion. I mean, your mission should align with the grants that you're asking for. So I, I think it affects it in that you, these are a set of parameters and questions about what is fundable, because you can't produce a project if you can't fund it. But I think you have to start with the project and then find the money versus the other way around. So I think that is a, you know, which is hard. And I think that's always, I mean, in museums, that's always a, who's, you know, you don't want the, what is it, tail wagging the dog. It's, you know, but I think on the other hand, you have to be, I mean, we would be remiss not to be aware of the logistics that go into making these things happen, I think. Yeah, but if you have partnerships, again, Front was... Uh, entangled with um, many institutions, and those institutions have a stability, so that gave a framework as well, right? So that's, one can go forward without having to be working with those institutions, but um, you are, you are, I have to say that you're wrong. Uh, galleries don't pay for production all the time. Um, I had a very difficult time getting, galleries didn't know what Cleveland was, and they didn't understand the marketplace, right? <laughs> That's, and, and, it, and they were very slow to come around. And of course they came around when it was all too late. Or, or to say it differently, we actually you know, do the list of artists according to a, an aesthetic project. And then, if needed, we find solutions to finance it. No, that, that's not the other way around. Otherwise, Jeff Koons would be invited to every biennial, no? no. <laughs> Forever. That's a question. And forever. Um, hi, Michelle. Um, well, in, we, in Springfield, they opened a new casino, and the city of Springfield gave MGM tons of money to move there. And uh, in Queens now, Amazon is going to give, or, or Queens rather, New York taxpayers are going to give Amazon like, what, a billion dollars or something like this. So I'm thinking about these strings that are attached and thinking that there's like another way that you could look, like you could actually flip the question of this talk and say what happens when public funding starts being given to uh, biennials in that I think when public money is given, it's, there's this transactional expectation, a very, very, very high one, in fact. And in fact, yeah. cities are, are willing to give a tremendous amount of money in order to have those transactional experiences happen. So actually, and there's this other idea of like, you know, Andrew Carnegie, who actually has a, a sense of obligation to a city and would actually give all this private money and that that's sort of the way things might possibly cycle. So that's just a, a flip. Um. Yes, mayors and governors are happy to uh, underwrite a kind of entrepreneurial enterprise when it comes to the arts, but it looks very different than what you imagine the outcome of that to be. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Was there a question? No, I guess it's <laughs> No. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an idea for the next talk, right? The evils of public money. <laughs> but, but public money is... is we're seeing less and less and less of it. Corporate money is coming into play. That was surprising for me with Cleveland. There was a lot of local corporate support. Cleveland has some big corporations. Um, and that ha they, that's different expectations. Um, uh, and that is corporate support will ally themselves with values that these productions put forward, their same values. So there's a different kind of outcome with that. So we're seeing more and more of that. I don't know, what about corporate support for corporate, New Orleans? Corporate, all the way. <laughs> I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, it's also foundations, it's also individuals. Yeah. I mean, it's always that mix. But I think, yeah. I mean, even institutionally, corporate fund, I mean, what, Guggenheim is UBS, Guggenheim is BMW, Guggenheim, I mean, I think it's yeah. a critical source of funding now. And I think, I mean, it's quite, in a, outside of the US, this question might be reversed, yeah. right? Public yeah. funding is not a thing. I've never, in my entire professional life, this, there is, the NEA is like a dream. It was a, you know, a censorship incident in the 90s. It's not something that I would ever think, oh, I'm gonna fund an exhibition through government support in any capacity. I mean, in the institutions that I've worked at get a lot of tax dollars from the county, et cetera, but it doesn't shape funding, it shapes a kind of civic responsibility that I think yeah. is the important yeah. strings. I think we are responsible to a public when we take taxpayer money, and there are institutions in Miami that don't take taxpayer money quite to say we're not interested in engaging that conversation, so I think it, it's a quite interesting yeah. paradigm to kind of yeah. think about how in this era that 
I mean, it's just, it's not even, it's not even a reality anymore, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. No, and it's interesting if you start thinking about the legacy institutions, let's say in New York, and what's happening with the philanthropic um, uh, foundations, whether that's Ford or whether that's Aggie Gunn, uh, the, the highly active social practice projects, that's what they are funding. So it really, you know, the static form, the static object, that engagement is not um, where the support is going. Right, and it's not to exhibitions, it's no. operational. That's right. It's totally infrastructural, no. which is critical, but also then you have to go out and get a corporate sponsor who likes the paintings that you're, you know, I think that is sort of how we're seeing that play out. I mean, it's interesting, do you have to show the corporate sponsor the work that's going to be sitting next to their logo? You make a deck. I mean, I think institutions and development departments that work very hard to make what are called sponsorship decks. And it's not, you know, they would have no oversight over a checklist whatsoever. It's, you never would see any kind of authorial control, but certainly they determine what artists, I mean, it tends to be quite, um, I'm trying to think of the nice word. It's not an incredibly complicated set of questions that they're asking. I mean, you know, they want to fund an exhibition because it outreaches to a community where they're literally opening a bank or because the artist looks like somebody that would wear their clothes. I mean, these aren't, I mean, you know, it's, it's the way we think about corporations. And I, I mean, I think they're, for better or worse, critical partners, but I think they're not, I haven't experienced a kind of um, level of control that maybe we, we are, there's an anxiety around. I mean, talking of clothes, has anyone ever, like a, a fashion brand, forced you to wear their clothes as part of a transactional deal related to the I mean, curator? they dress like you, you, Hugo Bot. I mean, all these things. You ask the curator what they're wearing to the opening. <laughs> the company dressed them. I mean, for better or worse. Depends how you look in Hugo Boss, I guess. Are there more questions from the audience? I mean, maybe as a way of wrapping this up, um, we seem to have kind of concluded that there's different rules for different places at different times. But are there any <laughs> kind of... Um, cool. <laughs> are there any kind of like best practice messages that could be um, donated as a sort of takeaway from this? Like certain rules you would have that this is the best way to manage working in this mix of state and private finance? No compromising? That's the only rule which is uh, which I really I'm interested in in a way, whatever the context is, you know, because it's always a question of uh, measure and you know appreciation of a specific uh, context. So it's not given once for all. all. You know, it's something you have to um, evaluate. You know, where does compromise start? You know, it's really important, I think, and that's a specific accuracy that we have to develop, no? because it's more and more tricky, no? <laughs> in a way. I also think, to circle back to both of your points, to begin with the artist, to begin with the artist, to begin with the projects. Let the funding come to the project that it needs to. Don't, you know, no compromises in terms of the project, no compromises in terms of the artist list. Don't yeah. insist they use cars. What did you say? Don't insist they use cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also walk back the necessity for transaction. Um, regardless of who you're talking to, and try to stretch what outcome can be, and not try to rely on those metrics. And that takes education, because you know, that is the world we're living in. That is measurable. Um, and different kinds of measurements have to be put into place. Yeah. Maybe another principle would be uh, never let you know, private money dictate the content of something. You, know, you have to propose and they have to say yes or no, and that's it. For me, it's super important. That's the only thing which is uh, crucial. No. Then you have long-term commitments, for example, for private companies into a project, a biennial, an art center. Then you have to, it's different, because you have to uh, really uh, work on the very, being very precise on this. Otherwise, you can be overwhelmed very, uh, very quickly and easily. So be precise and keep the conversation simple. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for a really enlightening talk. Um, thanks to speakers and thank you for coming.